Hello, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Laura Kruger. Laura is a board certified entomologist and vector ecologist at the Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control District. She's a self proclaimed hardcore bug nerd who believes the West Coast is truly the pest coast. Laura began her career as an uh, entomologist and technical trainer with the Western Exterminator Company over 20 years ago. And she's licensed as a pest control advisor, a qualified applicator, and vector control technician. She specializes in the control of mosquitoes, fleas, and rats. Laura receives her Master of Public Health from Yale University and a Biology of Science degree from the University of Michigan and Arbor. And college. To become an entomologist, I actually received uh, real training when I worked for Western Exterminator Company. It's exactly like Mike, our previous speaker, I joined the pest control industry 24 years ago, and I guess almost 25 now in 1998, I was hired by Western Exterminator Company. And as we all know, you can go to college to learn bugs, but until you actually go in the field, you really don't know how to do anything. And so when I started at Western, they, at that time, it was family owned and they put me in a nine month training program and I ran my own residential route. And after I completed the training program at Western, I joined their technical department and that began my intense love of the pest control industry and of the day-to-day -day work that we do. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's joined this webinar today. I know it's our busy season in August, and I just wanted to say also thank you for the important work that you do. Really, pest control um, is a public health profession, and it's really Pest, most of pest control is reliant on private industry. I do work for the Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control District, and we do provide limited services for fleas, um, and we do provide uh, more extensive services for mosquitoes, um, especially because they can impact such a, a wide area. But as Siavash said, I am a board certified entomologist and vector ecologist. I also have a pest control advisor license. and. I've learned a lot about fleas, especially in the last 15 years here um, in Orange County. So one thing is that's surprising is how small fleas are and how much of a just an overall headache and anxiety they can cause in, um, situations. In fact, it's even been said that fleas could be one of the most anxiety producing insects. I don't know if there's ever been a formal study on it, but specifically in response to the disease plague. Plague cases cause so much widespread hysteria and just an extreme amount of government expense. All because of this small uh, insect. It is, fleas are insects. Notice they don't have wings. They get places by jumping or crawling. Um, as you can see here, one of their definitive um, body characteristics is this flattened, very skinny, um, organism. I can also say as an entomologist, you know, fleas are odd because all their body parts have different names. The key, they're hard to key out. They're very small. And, you know, in pest control, it's hard too, because if you don't have a microscope in the field, which no one does, even our little tiny hand lenses that many of us have with us, you know, you're never going to be able to identify um, most of the fleas using hand lenses. And so because of that, you know, you, you, it's rare to get the flea to species in the field, but you should be able to probably, possibly even by looking down at your pants and seeing these small sesame seed sized insects that you're encountering fleas. Fleas are found worldwide. They're even found on Antarctica. So that's something I recently learned. And so following this presentation, we're all going to be taking a quiz and I'll I'll just let you all know that that could, you may see this later, that fleas are found on birds, they're found on animals um, and mammals, and they occur on all seven continents. Fleas move by jumping, and in general, they can jump greater than 150 times their own body length. I'm going to go ahead and attempt to play this video. Normally, I don't show videos, but photography is just so cool to see the fleas up close. So 
in the event this isn't working properly, uh, someone's going to jump in, hopefully see Avash or Lauren or Carrie and let me know. Sometimes to get where you want in life, you need to go all out. Fleas need to get off the ground and onto someone they can exploit. That's bad news if you've got fur or feathers. There are more than 2,000 flea species, each partial to its own kind of creature. But the one you'll most likely cross paths with is the cat flea. Fleas are one of nature's greatest jumpers, taking a gigantic leap almost too fast to comprehend. They're small and narrow, like a little sesame seed with legs. Their fly ancestors lost their wings millions of years ago to help them slip through fur with ease. Fleas are tough to get rid of. Stiff backwards facing hairs catch on fur when you try to pick them out. Try to squish one? Nope. Their flexible bodies are armored with rugged plates called sclerites. Adult fleas only eat one thing, blood. This cat flea prefers cat blood, but in a pinch, it'll latch onto you too. They lay eggs that drop from the cat's body into its bedding. A few days later, they hatch, and worm-like larvae wiggle out. Hungry larvae scavenge for food. Their favorite meal comes from mom and dad, adult flea poop. That's just semi-digested blood. Now who could turn that down? The larva curls up in a cocoon it makes from whatever dirt, sand, or other materials it finds nearby. A few days later, voila, all grown up. Now this hungry flea needs a warm body to call home. Its jump is super fast, a hundred times faster than the blink of an eye. But it takes more than muscle to move that fast. The flea can compress itself like a spring thanks to a rubbery protein called resilin in its legs and body. First, the flea pulls in its oversized rear legs and locks them in place. It squeezes and flattens its body, squishing the resilin and building up energy for the jump. Then, it releases the energy all at once. The flea tumbles through the air, legs extended. With a lot of effort and a little luck, it'll land on its target and the whole incredibly itchy cycle will begin again. All right. So as we saw in the video, um, which was nice, is to be able to see some flea larvae. I know in almost all of my career, I it's very rare to actually have someone present flea larvae in absence of adult fleas. But one thing about the flea life cycle that's important to know is fleas are like butterflies. They uh, have complete metamorphosis. And so adult fleas um, at within the female flea within 24 to 48 hours of taking its first blood meal is able then to begin laying eggs. And so the fleas lay eggs majority, there's kind of two types of fleas, but the fleas we have mainly in Southern California, all of them are going to lay their eggs 
primarily directly on the host animal's fur. The eggs themselves, when they're first laid, they are um, kind of smooth and wet, and they kind of stay on the host fur. But after, um, from what I can tell from reading it, some varying articles, after about six hours, 60 to 80% of the eggs are gonna fall off of the host. And that's important for many reasons. Um, the first of which is that the majority of fleas are gonna be associated with the nest sites or resting sites of animals. However, here, at least in Southern California, we have residents complaining all the time about seeing possums walking on the back walls of their home. And if you see possums or raccoons uh, walking on those back walls of your property, you can assume that these flea eggs are then falling off of these animals and landing onto your property. Now, that in itself isn't an issue unless you own pets. And as we know, about 80, you know, 65 to 80 percent of residences own at least one pet. And so the fact that these eggs, you know, are mainly laid on the host and then the eggs fall off the host and congregate in the nest areas. After about one to six days, it is temperature dependent. It also can potentially be based on the nutritional component of the blood meal, um, the eggs will hatch into larvae. And in all, you know, just in full transparency, I've never had a single resident. We identify here at the Vector Control District over a thousand samples a year submitted from residents and no one's ever submitted a flea larvae. And so, um, you know, flea larvae, they don't like light. They burrow deep into substrates. Um, and most people will never notice them. They have chewing mouth parts, as we saw in the video, and they're most the larvae are most successful if they're in a group with other larvae, which we'll talk about as we move through the presentation. And then after, and this is also temperature and nutrition availability dependent, the larvae then go through three larval instars in a period of five to 34 days until they then develop into pupa. And the pupal stage is the real headache for everyone who actually does flea control. And that's because within the pupal stage, the, the pupa itself or the emerged adult flea, it can survive from anywhere um, from five to 150 days. And so basically the pupal case itself is an impermeable to insecticides. And, and because of this reason, this is really why it's recommended that all flea, residential flea spray jobs involve two services spaced anywhere from seven to 10 days apart. And that's to account for the emergence of the pupil flea, fleas into the adult life stage. So overall, this whole life cycle can take as little as 27 days and it can take over 150 days um, to emerge as the adult flea. The life cycle here, um, I took from the CDC webpage and um, input these development times from Michael Russ seminal review paper on fleas that was published in 1996. So as I mentioned, it's really hard to identify fleas. Um, our lab, ha we had a graduate student who made a photographic online key. And I'm gonna encourage you all to check that out. And you can use the key, it's, it's for free. You can download it. It's, you know, photos of fleas, and it allows you to um, identify or speciate the flea. Although I've also told you that it's really tough to identify fleas, and for the most part, most of the fleas that you're going to find around uh, residential accounts in Southern California or across all of California are going to be, have a very similar life cycle and life stage, which is associated with people's pets. And so I also call, call this uh, key our hardcore pest control nerd material. So I encourage you to take it, take a look at it. Really why the vector control district is involved with fleas is because there's a number of health issues um, for people and also for pets, which are associated with fleas here in the Western United States. Now, what's kind of interesting is that sometimes people almost take claim that they take better care of their pets than they, they really do in real life. Um, so we'll take that with a grain of salt. But in, in reality, there are 
quite a number of detrimental effects that can happen to people and also to their pets. And there's just a huge amount of money which can be spent on flea control for pets. When I entered into the pest control industry in 1998, that's when topicals for pets were just being introduced to the market. So those would either be the pills or the topical medications that are put on the pet that control fleas. And so then for a period of time, there was a real decline in, in flea jobs for the pest control industry. And I've recently read that most of us, you know, flea jobs for pest control are probably about 5% of revenue for most companies, but definitely they could be the majority of headaches, depending on what type of um, job you get. And then also because fleas spread disease, there is inherently just another level of safety that pest control operators need to take. So in terms, there's three main categories. You've got fleas that can, fleas they can cause these allergy, um, like flea allergy dermatitis or tungasiasis, which we'll talk about, but it's not in the US, but it kind of is. And then we'll talk about how fleas, they can also be parasite vectors, especially for tapeworms. And then the diseases that fleas can spread to people. Thankfully, there's not many diseases that fleas spread to people, but here in Southern California, there is fleaborne typhus. There could also be plague. And then there can, um, there's cat scratch disease, also known as Bartonella. So a little bit about the flea associated dermatitis. So basically what happens here is that uh, fleas, they, as I mentioned, they need to feed multiple times each day, both males and female fleas do feed. So the flea punctures the skin to take a blood meal. They're looking to hit a capillary or a micro capillary to imbibe the blood. And then, but the saliva itself of the flea um, sets up an antigen antibody reaction. And so then that causes the animal or the person to scratch and the self-inflicted trauma can cause like um, papulars, pustulars, cysts, and secondary infections. It's estimated that over a billion dollars a year are, is spent on flea control products. So I wanted to just talk briefly about something called the Chigo flea. Now this flea, tungasiasis, it could also be called, I may be saying that wrong. This is not in the United States and it, that's a good thing because this particular flea, the adult fleas emerge from people. So instead of having a larval free crawling stage, um, instead of having just fleas associated with animal nests, what you have is that the adult female flea embeds into people's feet and then she spits out flea egg and then she continues to lay flea eggs and larvae which can then develop in sand and so the top photo here on the left you see is a who stocked photo of um, a child's feet in a region where the chigo flea is found and the bottom picture on the left is my cousin Kristen's foot she uh, works um, for an international aid organization and was in Africa two years ago, came home and she came home with, um, and she came home and a, a few weeks late, you know, she's got kind of like a bump on her toe. She said it took about two weeks. She finally went to uh, her dermatologist and the dermatologist was able to excise one of the, these chigo fleas. So I bring this up because in this case, my cousin Kristen lived in the Northeast in a very um, it was kind of in the winter months when she was afflicted with this, but there is definitely a possibility that if someone were to travel, come back with these, there could be um, localized infestations. And so I just wanted to bring that up. In this case, and in this life cycle, um, the, adult, the adult fleas are inside of people and spitting out the eggs, or it's just laying the eggs. The next, um, issue to talk about is the dog or cat tapeworm. And so overall dog and cat tapeworms, 99.99999% of these um, tapeworms occur in pet cats and dogs. And how this cycle works is that um, fleas are involved in the cycle. And because uh, fleas, basically they, uh, they can, 
harbor a life stage of the tapeworm parasite called the cystocercoid stage. And then by feeding on humans, either directly through the blood meal or by feeding, pooping, and then the human scratching the flea poop into the bite wound, they can, for a very small number of people, people who may be immunocompromised can become incidental hosts for the tapeworm. What's actually much more common is people to find the tapeworms inside of their pet cats and dogs. And so in pest control, oftentimes we're handed baggies that contain little grains of rice. It looks like, and the person is saying, hey, what's this? Can you get rid of this? Can you spray for this? Very rarely, but it occurs. You could be uh, provided with on the right here is the whole cat tapeworm. And as you can see at the top of the image is those proglotted segments, which come out the rear end of the animal and then get deposited onto surfaces. And that is what people most of the time end up uh, collecting and turning in. And so in order to treat tapeworm, the animal needs to receive a internal medication and then uh, in order to prevent them from continually getting reinfected by tapeworms, flea control must take place. Most often, uh, the, you're going to see these associated with kittens and puppies instead of the adult life stage of animals. All right, so now we're going to touch on what some of you might have seen in the news, and I'm going to attempt showing another video here, and this is just a summary of switching gears now to fleaborne typhus. This morning, a Houston man is in the hospital after undergoing a double amputation that cost him both of his hands and parts of his feet. And his family says this all started with a flea bite. Our Stephanie Whitfield is following this man's story for us this morning. Stephanie, how did this go from a bite to an amputation? Well, his family says he thought he had COVID or maybe the flu at first, but he just got sicker and sicker and eventually ended up in the hospital. Michael Corhorse is from Houston. He started feeling unwell here, but he went to San Antonio last month to help his mom after she underwent surgery. While Michael was there, he got so sick he couldn't get out of bed. When he eventually went to the emergency room, doctors told him he had typhus. His partner says doctors told them this type of typhus can only be caused by a flea bite. Michael has now spent a month in the hospital. He's had both of his hands and parts of his feet amputated. All right, so this is just one story that's gained nationwide media attention about a man in Houston who uh, an inf infection of fleaborne typhus led to the amputation of his hands and feet. And shortly after this, the media story came out about that man, um, Los Angeles County released this uh, information that three people in Los Angeles County died um, from typhus last year. And that was, those were the first reported deaths from fleaborne typhus in California since the 1990s. And so I bring this up because as more people are becoming um, in Affected with typhus, there could be greater and greater um, complications associated with those illnesses. So what is typhus? And typhus is, comes from the Greek word meaning hazy or confused, since many people who get typhus end up um, having some sort of uh, mental involvement as the disease progresses if it's not treated. There are three types of typhus in the United, uh, in the world. One is called scrub typhus. Interestingly, uh, scrub typhus was just detected in North Carolina, but scrub typhus is transmitted by chiggers and also by, uh, and the vertebrate host being rats. And it's primarily seen in East and Southeast Asia. There have been no cases in the United States reported. There's also epidemic typhus, and epidemic typhus is associated with the human body louse, and epidemic typhus is the pathogen Rickettsia prosecchii, and this is the uh, disease that there was a tremendous loss of life in World War I and World War II um, pre-development of DDT to control the body louse. And so Typhus, when I'm discussing typhus today, it's in relationship to fleaborne typhus, which is a disease associated with bacteria, rickettsia, typhi, 
potentially another bacteria called Rickettsia felis. And these bacteria are found um, in fleas. In fact, the only way to get fleaborne typhus is through having exposure to fleas or flea feces. You can't um, get typhus from having exposure to another person with typhus or by having exposure to a pet alone. The pet must have fleas. And so fleaborne typhus is most kind of Prior 1970 was associated primarily with Norway rats and Oriental rat fleas. And then beginning in the 1970s, more and more cases began to be associated with uh, possums, feral cats, and um, fleas in suburban and urban environments. And over the last 20 years, there's been an explosive growth in the cases of fleaborne typhus here in the United States. And I just wanted to point out that typhoid fever is not fleaborne typhus. It's still impact that, that disease is bad as well, but typhoid fever is a food is a bacteria as well that is primarily transmitted through the fecal oral route of transmission. And so sometimes we in Los Angeles, there are cases of typhoid fever. Um, that are treated, but typhoid fever and typhus are not related. O overall, typhus, it can be a serious in illness. It, it, over 85% of the cases that are reported to our agency are um, hospitalized anywhere from five to over 380 days. Um, and most people who get typhus, almost everyone has a fever of some kind, and it's a high fever, headache, aversion to light, and 50% of patients will break out in a rash. Now, you'll hear the media say that it's a flu-like illness, a flu-like illness, but please note that there is no blowing your nose, there's no sore throat, um, and there's rarely vomiting. And so mainly the illness itself is is related to the high fever, the headaches, and um, potentially the rash. So how does somebody get typhus? You know, here in Southern California, there's been a lot of research that's been conducted and it shows that fleas that are found on backyard li wildlife, such as raccoons, possums, feral cats, um, they can be infected with the bacteria that causes typhus. People come in contact with the fleas mainly by having a pet at home. And that's something we see with the human cases. 80 to 85% of human cases have a pet either at home or they're observing feral cats or possums around their uh, property. The best way to prevent fleaborne typhus is to keep pets on flea control. And then also to make sure that, they're, that you're not feeding pets outside and that uh, other animals are not not accessing other food sources on your property, such as fallen fruit or gardens, and then further protection by eliminating pla places that animals can hide, such as sub areas. Sub, and I'll just say this for the pest control operators, this is the number one exposure that pest control operators have reported to me when I've interviewed them after they've gotten typhus. And of the 285 cases here in Orange County, I've interviewed, nine, I'm sorry, seven pest control operators that have gotten typhus. And of the seven, five of them reported dead animal removal in a sub area without proper PPE in the week leading up to the um, infection. And that's because the sub area is the absolute perfect place for flea development. Um, since larval fleas do not like exposure to sunlight and it's dark under there. And if an animal that's living in the sub area then crosses the street or gets hit by a car, what's that going to do is that it's not going to return to the nest site and the larval and pupating fleas are going to emerge. They're going to be attracted to light and they're going to enter the home through cracks and that's how they're going to impact the family. Also, it's recommended to protect yourself when doing or picking up any dead animals. If that takes on a life of its own in pest control, you know, many of us would say, well, hey, I always protect myself when I'm picking up dead animals. But specifically, well, as the, I move through the presentation, I'm gonna give the specific PPE recommendations for dead animal removals in typhus areas. 
So the fleaborne typhus transmission cycle, you know, animals in the backyard or in the neighborhood have fleas. Those fleas could be infected with typhus. And then um, our pets serve as bridge vectors for fleas and they bring the fleas into our home environment where we can have exposure to them. A little bit about the bacteria um, itself. The Rickettsia bacteria is a gram-negative obligate intracellular bacteria in the Rickettsia family. And the bacteria mainly live in the flea intestine, which means they're shed in flea feces. People can get, can still get um, typhus through a couple routes of transmission. The first one is inhaling flea feces. So if you're petting an animal and the animal has fleas, there could be flea dirt and you inhale it, you could potentially have an exposure like typhus pneumonia exposure. You could also scratch flea feces into the bite wound. So as we'll see, fleas poop when they eat. And then, you know, following the bite, if you scratch those feces into the bite wound, that increases your risk of getting typhus. And then also if, in general, it's believed that some cases are transmitted slowly through the bite of the flea itself. The bacteria, these Rickettsia bacteria, they can be transmitted vertically from mother to offspring, and they can also be transmitted horizontally through something called co-feeding, and co-feeding transmission is if you can imagine a host animal is covered in fleas, if the fleas are feeding nearby one another, they can transmit the bacteria to one another through the host's immune system in that route. And Rickettsia typhi and Rickettsia felis have both been detected in fleas and in people in Texas. So I'm going to show this video of flea feeding. And so as you see here, the adult flea takes the blood meal and it in the standard head down posture. And then as it feeds, about 60 to 65% of fleas are gonna defecate as they feed and they're gonna use their hind legs to um, take that poop off of themselves, especially as you see here. If the poop dries on the, the insect, that'll use them to scratch it off. And then the blood will dry on someone's skin. And then if the bite, if there's a reaction, then the person could potentially itch uh, the, the flea feces into the bite wound. In terms of symptomology, how do you know if you get to, you know, what are the symptoms of typhus? There is the high fever, shaking, chills, weakness, headache. These are the high fever and headache are the two most commonly reported symptoms. Also photophobia or an aversion to light. And in 50% of people, they'll get a rash after four to five days, and the rash will extend from the trunk of the body all the way to the hands and soles of the feet. And at least here in Orange County and Los Angeles County, 85% of the cases are going to be hospitalized. Uh, they're going to stay in the hospital anywhere from five days with the longest stay being over 368 days. And then most people who get typhus are uh, we see people across all ages getting typhus, uh, both kids and adults and older people. And it's believed that for every one case of typhus that's officially reported, there are four additional cases in the, in the community. And then in some studies that have been conducted in Texas, where they take blood samples from community members, they find that up to 15% of people in fleaborne typhus endemic areas have been exposed to typhus. And so that's why I'm encouraging all of us on this call today, um, we're all, if you're doing pest control work, you're gonna be at a higher risk for getting typhus. And so I'm gonna encourage all of you to check out this USGS medical alert wallet card. This is provided by the CDC and USGS on the webpage. You can use the QR code to find it. And it's a small card that could be put in your wallet or you can upload to your phone and put it in your in case of emergency section. And it says, this person works with wildlife and may have been exposed to certain zoonotic diseases not routinely considered in the differential diagnosis of febrile illness. Also, from working with so many pest control people my whole life, I know many of you are not going to go to the doctor right away at the when you're experiencing symptoms. You have a tendency um, maybe to wait 
And so waiting is what causes the majority of people to get hospitalized. The longer it takes you to get antibiotics, the sicker you're going to get. And so certainly you're going to want to talk to your your doctor and just let them know that you do pest control for a living and so that it's noted on your file in the case that um, you arrive at a hospital and you're not able to give your, your medical history. And I wanted to just give a little shout out to this uh, person. This is Megan Dom. She is an author who lives in Los An who lived in Los Angeles. She's since moved. And in 2010, she actually got typhus and she wrote a series of articles about her experience for the Los Angeles Times and one of them is called Medical Odyssey and Back from the Brink. She actually almost died and she um, received medical intervention and she lived and she writes this really compelling first person narrative of what the illness was like and you know how she reacted when she found out it was caused by a flea. So I'm gonna encourage everyone to check out the book, Unspeakable. She extends, she also goes on at length and wrote a whole essay about her experience of almost dying from typhus in Los Angeles. So kind of, I know for some of us who've been in pest control a while, like where did typhus come from? It wasn't here when we first started. You know, it was always in the background. It's been at low levels in the Southern California area. Over the 1940s, there was some spikes in cases. It's likely that the spike in cases was due to um, people returning from World War II and also the large military bases that were in the area at that time. With DDT, that was able to knock out most typhus and, and flea issues and there just wasn't a problem. And so in all of the 1990s, at least in Orange County and Los Angeles County, there were very few cases of typhus. And then what we saw is in 2006, there seemed to be some cases that were reported in Orange County after a 15 year lapse of cases. And then the case numbers have just continued to build. And so since 2006 now, in less than 20 years, we went from one case a year all the way um, to multiple cases a year for a total of 292 cases reported in Orange County since 2006. And, you know, I think it's important to note that there used to be quite a bit of this louse-borne fever, uh, um, louse-borne typhus, epidemic typhus associated with World War I, World War II, and found mainly in the South. There's been some really interesting uh, articles and books written about typhus in the South. It was associated with the peanut farming industry and the Norway rat issues that came with the peanut farming agricultural industry. And peanut farming was replaced mainly by cotton. And now we have, now the United States, there's hardly any cases of typhus in the South. Majority of cases are gonna be found in California, Texas, and Hawaii. So I pulled this data down from the, um, California Department of Public Health, and it was with the date of July 26, 2023. And what you can see is that a time period from 2014 to 2022, and you can see the cases of typhus keep increasing. And so in 2014, there was uh, maybe it looks like 75 cases of typhus reported in California. And then in 2022, there were over 200 cases of typhus reported in California. And what's interesting about the reporting of typhus is there's really this clustering of typhus in Los Angeles and Orange counties. Of all of the cases of typhus that have been reported in California since 2014, 95% of them occur in Los Angeles and Orange counties. Although it's important to note out that Riverside and San Bernardino are gaining cases as is Ventura. So it's likely that we'll begin to see more cases uh, each year, and we'll begin to see more and more cases in Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Ventura area. Here in California, typhus is a reportable disease, but it's not reportable nationally, and so there's no good way to know how many cases of typhus are in the United States, meaning that the CDC doesn't regularly collect or analyze the data. So, in Los Angeles and Orange County, there's been this major increase in typhus. And 
you can see that Los Angeles County seems to have like a steeper slope of the line of case increase as compared to Orange County, but in general, both cases are increasing in both areas. What's new to typhus in the last year was that it's always been believed that typhus is a relatively mild illness, which is surprising to me considering the 85% of people are hospitalized five or more days that are reported. But in 2022, when three people died from typhus, the case fatality rate increased. So in years previous, when I had provide information to groups about typhus, I would normally say, hey, no one ever dies from typhus as long as you get the antibiotic treatment. But what we're seeing is that as more and more people get infected with typhus, people are gonna to begin to die from typhus. So even though the case fatality rate is low, 1.8%, it's still not zero. And so um, that is unfortunate. And part of the reason why um, it's not zero or part of the reason why it's typhus can lead to death is because it's not that common yet. I mean, when we compare the number of cases of typhus to COVID, there's no comparison. You know, most doctors have seen many, many cases of COVID and very few cases of typhus. And so it's the delay in diagnosis, which leads people to getting really ill. Most people who are hospitalized with typhus have seen a doctor three times prior to their hospitalization. Um, they just were not provided the correct antibiotic or the correct um, diagnosis. And, you know, if you have any of these, if you've got diabetes or if, or alcohol abuse, you know, those are risk factors for acquiring um, severe typhus, something to be, con to consider. You know, and why are these cases of typhus increasing? Like what's going on? Is it really dynamic climate change? Is it that there's more bacteria out there in the fleas? And I'm here to say that our agency monitors the rates of typhus in flea populations, which is normally pretty steady. About 1% uh, of fleas have the bacteria that can cause fleaborne typhus. But our agency did detect um, two years ago the prevalence of typhus and fleas jumped to 7%. But overall, it's fairly low. And, and that makes sense because if it was a higher prevalence, we would see more human cases. And so overall, you know, bacteria doesn't appear to be increasing that much in the fleas. Could it be that there's more animals out there? Is it due to these feral cat colonies that are popping up everywhere? Could it be that animals are mingling at the feeding stations, skunks, raccoons, rats, and cats all eating out of the same bowl? They're sharing their fleas. Um, is it that peep, there's just more people living where the animals are located? Or is it that the people living near the animals are just coming into contact with them more often. Like uh, one of our employees in this slide here found a possum, of course, in his garbage can, took some selfies with it, or this Orange County resident above. I swear that possum looks a little bit like a panda. It's not a panda bear. It is a, it's a severely obese possum that's sitting on that woman's lap. So obviously these are all animals that are coming in close contact with people. So we, we really don't have any great answers for why typhus is increasing. It just is increasing. The next disease that fleas can spread to people is cat scratch disease, which is Bartonella. And so this is infections which come from either the scratch or the fleas associated with cats. And once this is another um, illness that's primarily found or associated with kittens. It was just kitten season. Um, I'm sure many of you know if you do pest control. And so there's been this surge in fleas and surge in kittens in the environment. And then there's also been a surge in typhus disease. And also um, journals report that after kitten season, there's an increase in this cat scratch disease as well. This disease is also not nationally reportable. So there's no good numbers to track it. Although it's been um, it's believed that it's one of the most common vector-borne diseases. It results in a low-grade fever and these enlarged tender lymph nodes. So here's an example of someone with an enlarged lymph node under their armpit. It's likely that they were then bitten on their hand. So this is interesting. We see this with the disease plague as well, which is that the limb or area of the body that's bitten by the flea, the bacteria moves through the lymph system and causes like these um, swellings. And so the person who has the swelling behind their ear 
was likely bitten by a flea on um, like their neck or head area. And plague disease, plague is not that common. On average, there's seven cases annually in the United States. Most of them are associated with um, prairie dogs and rural areas. Also, they can be associated with hunting and skinning of animals, but plague is still out there. Thankfully, there have been no plague detections in Norway rats since 1924 in Los Angeles County. So Los Angeles has the distinction of being the last city in the United States to have an outbreak of plague associated with rats. And so we're coming up on the 100 year anniversary of the Los Angeles pneumatic plague outbreak, which occurred in 1924. And it led to at least 41 people's death. But what's pretty impressive about the Los Angeles pneumatic plague out or plague outbreak in general was that in 1924, health officials were able to um, stop the epidemic within a single season through mass extermination of rats and ground squirrels. And it was the plague in 1924 in Los Angeles, which led widely to an increase in um, building codes and overall increase in sanitation leading to garbage pickup and um, a safer environment for everyone who lives in cities in California today. So the deal with plague is that fleas have a role in plague and that role is spreading the bacteria from animal to animal and also from animal to person. What's interesting with the plague as compared to other diseases is that the plague kills the rodents as well. So ground squirrels, nori rats, Roof rats and house mice will all die from a plague infection. When they die, their fleas are gonna jump off and that's gonna increase the likelihood that the fleas come in contact with people. And then once in a person, the flea back, once the bacteria gets in a person, it causes like a swelling or a bubo to form. But if the infection is allowed to persist, it could eventually, get into the lungs and cause pneumonic plague. And pneumonic plague would be the airborne form of the disease. And that's when people can transmit plague to one another because through the air, through breathing. Although interestingly, it's, it's, it's believed that um, pneumonic plague would be easily controlled because people become so sick that they would seek medical attention. And we have, Nowadays, there's plenty of antibiotics to treat people and control the disease. So it's really, you know, if there were plague is on the list of pathogens that could be related to um, a, an attack, you know, like a terrorism attack. And so there's the fear is if you read through the documents that if plague were ever to be dropped, you know, used as a weapon in the United States that it would lead to a sylvatic cycle continuing for length, meaning it'd be much harder to control the cycle when it's related to the animals um, as compared to the people. Thankfully, there has never been a successful use of plague as a biologic terrorism agent in the United States. Although during World War II, uh, there's a lot of history which shows that Japan was working to potentially drop fleas infected with plague in the Southern California area. And we can be thankful that that never happened. So just in general for a flea disease prevention, you know, CDC says, hey, reduce rodent and animal habitat around your home, limit exposure to stray or wild animals, wear repellent if you're gonna be exposed to fleas, and then to keep your pets on flea control products year round. And I'm gonna say, Second that, um, at least in Southern California, flea development can occur year round. And then most importantly, don't allow pets to sleep on, the, on your bed. Pets should sleep in their own designated space, which is not sharing a bed with people. So back to the adult flea, back to the flea life cycle. We're going to dig in just a little bit deeper about fleas and their biology. So, you know, when we look at this picture of, oh, adult fleas, oh yeah, it might, sometimes my cat gets fleas. I can find one or two on my cat or, or whatnot. Just remember that the majority of the fleas in that 
population are going to be in the egg phase, the larval phase, and the pupa phase. So the adult life stage is less than 5% of the total flea population. But adult fleas can be used to imply how many fleas are in the environment by looking at animals and seeing how many adult fleas are on the animal. You can then say, well, there must be, you know, extrapolate that there's way more fleas that are in the environment. A little bit about flea eggs. I, I like this picture because it shows someone's finger and on their finger, it are, the flea eggs are stuck. Potentially they were freshly laid. You can see how small the eggs are. It's very unlikely that any of us would be able to see the flea eggs. Um, you know, unless you were really looking, but most of the time we're gonna be detecting the fleas in the adult life stage. Now regarding the flea larvae. So there are these three larval instars and the development of the flea larvae is temperature dependent and also nutrient dependent. Interestingly, the groups of larvae are gonna develop most successfully, which makes sense because if the larvae are required to feed on the feces of adult fleas, or larvae, you know, the, they feed on the feces of adult fleas or larvae, then the more larvae are present, the more food source is going to be available for them to um, consume and develop. The thing about the um, the thing about fleas in general are the host, when they groom themselves, they can remove adult fleas. But most of the time, the host animals are not removing the larval fleas. So there's very little removal of larval fleas from the environment. Um, however, if the flea, the larval fleas are exposed to like a reduction, like way lower relative humidity. So an exposure of 33% relative humidity would be lethal. All these fleas, they're looking for places to develop with a higher relative humidity and they, it has to be somewhere without light. And so they, the larvae prefer to develop in dark areas and they're gonna burrow underneath a substrate or into the carpet um, to restrict the light. And it's the burrowing behavior of the larvae which can make them tough to control and it can make them hard. That's why it's recommended the, to have repeated vacuuming. Although vacuuming can remove larvae from carpeting, um, repeated vacuuming is what is recommended. And then the larvae themselves, you know, they feed on this flea dirt. The presence of flea dirt on a pet is indicative of a flea infestation. And I think these are pretty cool pictures of the flea larvae. You can see here that they are, they appear to be white with these bristles, these longer, they're not really, I wouldn't consider them to be hairy, but they definitely have some long bristles associated with their bodies. Oftentimes they're red since they were, they were feeding on blood. And I'm going to skip these two uh, videos, but I there's some great videos of um, fleas and just the incredible flea burden that animals can have um, in the environment out there. What's kind of interesting too about fleas is they have this pre-pupa phase. And honestly, this is really strange, I think, which is that prior to pupation, um, what they're going to do is they're going to expel their entire gut contents and then they're going to take and form into like a C shape and that is necessary for them in order to create their cocoon. Now what's kind of cool is that in order to create the cocoon, the larvae have to come in contact with a vertical surface not a horizontal surface, but a vertical surface. And that's probably to assist in them con con like curling their body because their mouth parts is what they use to spin this cocoon. 50% of pupa will end up making some sort of cocoon. And um, after they make this cocoon, they're gonna go ahead and they'll, they'll molt into the pupal stage. And the cocoons are desiccant resistance. They can withstand really low relative humidity. And um, once they reach the pupal stage, we can, if they have a cocoon, it's almost impenetrable to insecticides. Now, 40% of pupa might just not have that vertical 
surface or for other reasons, they're going to go ahead and they're going to pupate naked. And so if they pupate naked, what you'll see on the left here is a picture of a flea pupa. And on the right, what you'll see is the pupa is darkening. And what that actually is, is the adult flea, which is a um, darkening and that pupil case is still clear and hard on the outside. And because the flea pupil case is still around the flea, it is also difficult to get insecticides to penetrate that, that pupil case. One thing that is seen with um, the pupa is that the days needed to complete pupation decreases with increasing temperature. So at 80 degrees, which is, you know, minimum temperature for most of Southern California right now, pupil development can occur in 10 days or less. And then if at 60 degrees, that's going to take 30 days or more. So you see a, a big change in the amount or length of time it takes for the fleas to develop. And then same thing with emergence, um, which is that you can get at 80 degrees, 100% of the fleas will be emerged from their pupil cases within 20 days. And then um, at 60 degrees, it will take around 80 days for those flea pupa to emerge as adult fleas. So what about that emergence from the pupil stage? Many of us can be are familiar with that, which is you look down, you're somewhere and all of a sudden you're covered in fleas and how did they find you? They find us through vibrations, through heat and through CO2. The adult, fee, the adult fleas themselves, they use those three cues to find the host if, when they emerge from the pupil case. And as I mentioned, both male and female fleas, fees, fleas feed and that females, they're gonna increase their body weight over 140% each time, every time that they feed. So that's a 15 times their body weight increase with the blood meal. And that's why the majority of them then take, you know, they poop and eat so they can make some space so that they can then hop away. But it's also why male fleas are more likely to be moving around on the host. They're all, when they take a blood meal, um, they are not growing as large. It's easier for them to move around on the host. They increase their body weight by about 20% only each time that they feed. And then how long do they live? The adult females, you know, how long they live is really dependent on animal grooming. For animals like possums, they're not going to be doing many much grooming. And so fleas can live on possums a long time. But on feral cats or on cats in general, they do a lot of grooming. They're going to groom and remove them. And so, you know, you can have them living up to 50 days and off of a host, it's unlikely they'll survive more than 10 days. So most of the times it's the fleas waiting in the pupil case that are going to jump on people and bite them. And I know we're getting close to time. I'm just going to take a couple more minutes to finish up here, which is on urban wildlife. You know, urban wildlife have a lot of fleas. On average, possums will have about anywhere from 70 to 100 fleas. The highest number of fleas per possum we found is over 1,000. Based on models of egg laying, a possum that has over 1,000 fleas on it, if half of them are male and female, would then produce upwards of 6,000 eggs a day in the environment. And so these animals really lead to populations of fleas being maintained in the environment. And also you can see that the burrowing animals, skunks, ground squirrels, Norway rats have higher numbers of fleas because the animal burrows themselves are conducive to flea growth and development. On our agency's website at ocvector.org forward slash flea key, we break down the types, the different species of fleas in Orange County and the different hosts that they've been found on. You know, I just wanted to point out Norway rat versus roof rat. We've got a roof rat at the top, a Norway rat at the bottom of the slide. The Norway rat kind of uh, looks a little more muscular from all of its digging activity. It's going to have smaller ears. Its tail is going to be shorter and potentially um, thicker. And Norway rats can have a large number of fleas and mites associated with them. 
Roof rats, not so much. Our labs looked at over 780 roof rats and we've only found like three to be infested with fleas. And that's just because roof rats generally don't burrow. Roof rats that do burrow, we would expect them to have fleas. But we do see bird mites, um, bird mites, rat mites. Bird mites can survive at lower relative humidities. And so roof rat nests sites can have large populations of um, bird or rat mites. In order to get fleas off the host, our lab has to uh, collect animals, euthanize the, humanely euthanize the animal, pick off the fleas, and then test them, identify them and test them for disease. CDC says that there's three common fleas in the United States that cause disease, of course, cat fleas, ground squirrel fleas, and uh, oriental rat flea, which is found on Norway rats. And Fleas can be in public spaces, schools starting up these next couple of weeks, and any school sites with burrowing rodents potentially are going to contribute to the flea population. And any place with large number of feral cats or feral cat feeding is going to contribute to flea issues. Fleas are active year round in most of California with the peak infestations occurring May through November. And um, that's why we recommend keeping fleas on flea control year round. And the reason why fleas can persist for so long in the environment is that they can survive in the in protected microhabitats. And that's why getting our flea control treatments into the areas where fleas are found is so important. I just wanted to also mention that uncommon flea hosts. It happened this year. We had a uh, vector ecologist in San Mateo, uh, resident complaining about fleas in their property. The vector ecologist followed up on the service request and was able to collect um, this species of fleas from bird nests. And so some migrating birds can have fleas. Um, it's rare, but it's a possibility. And in the event that your company is called out to respond to diseases in fleas, you know, the state of California recommends that the goal of flea disease control is less than one flea per host animal. And so I recommend anyone who does or conducts flea control or wants to get into disease control to physically inspect the, the site prior to bidding the job. You know, what transmission cycles are present? What types of animals are there? Are there any additional safety equipment costs or disposal fees that you're gonna look into? And then of course, to follow up any local state or federal rules. And then you're gonna need to clearly communicate workplace safety SOPs to your employees. And you know, are you gonna give a guarantee? something to consider. In general flea control, it's a minimum two to three services occurring seven days apart. You know, IGRs, conventional insecticides, dust, enhanced sanitation, and treating the pets at the same time are key. And I'm going to just finish up here and I'm ready to take some questions about fleaborne typhus PPE. So, you know, we recommend using an and actually, I should say OSHA recommends an N95 respirator. I put here N100 or P100 if you're doing work in a hantavirus area, that would be the recommended respirator. If you're doing trapping of live animals, removing dead animals, or crawling in sub areas or attics. Also recommended long sleeve shirts and pants, double socks and gloves, coveralls, mattress protector. You know, you could wearing coveralls. T having plastic bags, extra uniforms, and insect repellent. And then, of course, for all of you who do pest control, make sure your own flea, your own pets are on flea control so that you're not bringing fleas home from the job site. That's a persistent issue for us here at Vector Control. We do have some flea traps in the locker rooms. But I'm going to just fast forward here to my contact slide, and I wanted to thank you for your attention today, and I can take some questions. Thank you so much, Laura. It was a great talk. I really enjoyed it.